On this channel, we have looked at a lot of really interesting stories from Call of Duty. We've looked at characters, we've looked at storylines, we've even gone as far as to look at some of the more confusing endings of Call of Duty games. But one thing that I have never talked about on this channel was the story of the most confusing Call of Duty game ever to be released. Now that is of course Black Ops 3, and today I'm going to attempt to explain to you exactly what happens in this ultra confusing campaign. Now before we do that, I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm starting a new thing over on Twitch where once a week I actually stream a Call of Duty campaign. Normally this is going to be every single Monday, but we're making an exception today and we're going to be streaming the very first Call of Duty game ever to be released, Call of Duty 1, over on Twitch. We're going to be playing the entire campaign, and if you want to check it out, it's the first link down in the description and i will be streaming it as soon as this video goes live so come check it out we'll be streaming the entire campaign and this is something we're going to be doing every single week with the next campaign so for example next monday we will be looking at call of duty 2 so if you want to check that out first link down in the description but without further ado let me shut up Let's talk about Black Ops 3. So the Black Ops 3 campaign is loved by some, but probably hated by most. And I think there's two pretty good reasons for that. The first of which is it's not linked with the other two Black Ops games whatsoever. Frank Woods and Alex Mason have nothing to do with the Black Ops 3 campaign. It is loosely tied to the Black Ops story, but that's not what we're talking about today. The reason why I think most people dislike this campaign is it's so confusing that it's actually relatively difficult to understand what actually happens in this campaign. What is going on with these characters that are brand new to us? And it's never really explained throughout the entire campaign directly. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like it. So in this video, what I'm going to try to do is explain to you exactly what happens in this game. And then if you go back and play Black Ops 3 after this, you might actually appreciate the campaign a little bit more once you understand what the hell is actually going on with this mess of Black Ops 3. Now, I think the easiest way to do this is not by looking at every mission explaining everything that goes on, but by looking at three individual aspects of the game that when looking at them completely explain what's going on. And those three things are the timeline, who your character actually is, and who or what Corvus actually is. By explaining these three, I think you'll fully understand what is going on in this campaign. But without further ado, let's dive into it, starting off with the timeline of this Just game. Just so we're clear, if this goes wrong, you never existed. So looking at the Black Ops 3 missions, the order that you play them in is what you're seeing on screen here, starting with Hypocenter, ending with Life, but that's not the actual order that they take place in the real world. This is the order that they take place in real world. First of all, the Hypo Center in New World take place actually at the end, right before the last mission, which is called Life. I've heard a lot of people say that that very last mission is actually the first mission in the campaign. That is not true. That doesn't make any sense. And here's why. So starting at the beginning, well, kind of the beginning, with the mission called Hypo Center. This is a mission where you are sent to Egypt to rescue a high value target. Now, for the sake of this video, it doesn't matter who that target is. All that matters is this mission is technically the the only mission that happens in the real world in real time. And by the end of this mission, you are getting swarmed by a bunch of enemy robots when at the end you get overtaken and a robot literally rips off your arms and legs. And one person individually comes to your rescue. And that is someone known as John Taylor. <laughs> By the second mission, New World, what happens here is when you're in the hospital and they are trying to fix you, they put a bunch of prosthetics on you, arms and legs, and link you up with something new called a direct neural interface. This is something that was very, very common in both Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 4. And with this direct neural interface, you can use all of these augmentations like your prosthetic limbs, and you can even interact with various computers and other people with direct neural interfaces. Now, in the second mission called New World, basically Basically what they do is they hook you up with your kind of trainer named John Taylor, another person who has a DNI, and he trains you to be a soldier with this direct neural interface. Can't be 
What is happening to me? Right now? Right now, you're in a medically induced coma being prepped for surgery. You've got a new bit of hardware inside your head. It's called a direct neural interface, or DNI. I've got one, too. That's how I'm able to communicate with you. Your DNI is what connects your mind with your new body and the larger world around you. We're connected. All of this is a simulation inside our minds. But halfway through this mission, something goes wrong. It starts glitching out, and basically you have a panic attack as soon as you see the robots within the DNI. And this scene is incredibly important. Because during the scene, you have a flashback to you laying in the hospital bed and John Taylor getting pulled away from you. Now, at the time, in the simulation, you were told that this is your meds acting up and don't worry, this will work itself out. But in fact, that's not it. This is your character literally dying. And I have proof of it. So before every mission starts in Black Ops 3, there's a little bit of a journal entry written by John Taylor in the past tense. Before the very first mission, you can read this here. The important part is right at the very end. It is talking about that first mission that they went on. And in this, it says, The sole survivor of Hendrick's team was taken to Zurich facility to undergo emergency life-saving procedures. After being stabilized, they were quickly identified as a potential candidate for the expansion of the Cyber Ops program and were fitted with a DNI prior to limb replacement surgery and full body augmentation. I personally interfaced to assist with their integration, acclim, and training. They had potential, unfortunately, complications arose during the procedure they were pronounced dead shortly thereafter. so this is obviously talking about your character it's saying that your character died on the operating table when getting fit for prosthetics and the dni you literally die during the second mission so this leaves us with the question, what is the rest of the campaign? Now, the rest of the campaign is interesting because it's the events leading up to that first mission. All of the missions throughout the rest of the game are your memory flashing before your eyes as you die, and they're all the missions that led up to you actually dying. Now, there's a little twist to this, but the reason why we know this is the very next scene after that second mission, you wake up in the hospital and see Hendrix laying on the bed beside you. But we know from that first journal entry, the only person that lived after that mission was you. Hendrix is dead. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is where things get kind of confusing. Because at this point, the rest of the missions that you play through throughout the game all take place before that very first mission. Hendrix was alive for those missions. But it is your memory remembering them. The reason why we know this is because every single time we see Hendrix, he has augmentations. He has prosthetic limbs, arms, legs, things like that. But in that very first mission that technically takes place at the end of the campaign, he doesn't have any. He has his normal arms and legs. He was never fitted with prosthetics or a DNI, which means you are imagining him having all of those prosthetic limbs. This is all taking place in your brain. So this explains the timeline of the game. The next question, who is your character? So at the very beginning of the game, you were able to choose either a male or female character. This is one of the few Call of Duty games where there is character customization and you can be either male or female. Generally, you're just either Frank Woods or Price or Soap or something along those lines, a set storyline. In this one, you can choose a character, but if you have subtitles on, anytime your character talks, your character doesn't have a name. It just says player with whatever they're saying, which is very, very odd that you never actually get a name. Now, there's actually a really easy answer to who your character actually is, but it's a confusing easy answer. So your first clue comes at the end of that very first mission once again. At the end of that mission, you are saved by John Taylor. John Taylor comes to your rescue and evacs you from that area. But as we know from that very opening journal, everyone on Hendrick's team was dead. Taylor was one of those people in that team, which means Taylor didn't save you. Taylor should technically be dead, which means you were hallucinating that entire thing. Piece of evidence number two. 
In that second mission, when you look at your bedside table, you are able to see a bandana on the side of your bedside table. This bandana is actually from someone known as Rachel Kane. As you find out later in the campaign, your character and her have some sort of relationship in the past. You guys were intimate or something along those lines, and she leaves you with that bandana. Now, for the rest of the campaign, whenever you see Taylor, Taylor is wearing that bandana on his left arm. Strange, right? Piece of evidence number three. In the very last mission called Life, you basically the entire mission are dealing with Corvus. And in this mission, at one point, Corvus puts up a mirror to you. And when looking in the mirror, your character actually morphs into John Taylor. This combined with the very last scene of the campaign, where you exit the building and a soldier asks, what's your name? This is what you say. Imagine yourself. What's your name, soldier? In a frozen forest. I said, what's your name? Taylor. So what I heard as the main theory here is that, whatever, you were just your character throughout the whole game, but Taylor's memories got implanted in your DNI and you became Taylor. I don't think that's right, and once again, it all comes down to that very first journal entry that we see. We know that only one person survived that initial mission, so you and Taylor couldn't both be alive, which means the only person left, if you're saying you're Taylor, is Taylor. You are John Taylor throughout the entire campaign. Now the question is, is how are you seeing yourself in third person? How are you interacting with Taylor the whole time? And at one point in the campaign, Taylor even dies. He gets shot in the head. Basically, that's you projecting yourself onto other characters. In fact, in that scene where Taylor gets shot in the head and killed, he's actually projecting himself onto another character named Dylan Stone, who is essentially the behind-the-scenes evil character within Black Ops 3. Why does he project himself onto that character? Because he feels bad for the events that happen. He feels bad that his entire team is dead, and he is projecting himself into that evil character to, I guess, make himself feel better or worse. I don't fully know at that point. But this is all tied together when we answer the question as to who is Corvus. So I kind of sent you down the wrong path here. Corvus isn't a who, it's a what. And what it's presented as in the game is that it's basically like an infection in the DNI. That it is there and it is screwing with people's minds via their DNI, almost like a virus. But that's actually not the case. What Corvus actually is, is death. Almost imagine him as the Grim Reaper. And the reason why we know this is for a few reasons. First of all, the name Corvus is actually a type of raven, the bird of death. And almost every single time we see Corvus, he is surrounded by ravens. Even when you kill people in the last mission life, they explode into ravens. He is literally the symbol for death. And throughout the campaign, yes, there is an overarching story with some of the characters and the bad guys, but really the big bad guy is Corvus. And you're not fighting Corvus, you're fighting death, which matches up with everything that we talked about. You're trying to fend off death via your memories, but by the end of the campaign, you find out that the only way you can beat Corvus is by literally joining your brain, Taylor's brain, with Corvus. Now, the one thing that's interesting about Corvus specifically is throughout the campaign, you see him more and more and he comes up more and more. This is because your character is getting closer and closer to death, when in the final mission, Life, it is all about Corvus. You are literally fighting off Corvus. And in the very last scene at the end of the game, you literally see a physical fight between Taylor and Corvus before they both finally disappear. This is symbolizing the death of Taylor. So really, this entire campaign isn't a story of what happened with the DNIs and Corvus and beating this virus. This story is literally Taylor's life flashing before his eyes, or I guess I should say slowly playing out before his eyes. It's basically the whole theory of when you die, your life flashes before your eyes. And that is the story of Black Ops 3. 
super over confusing. They never fully explain it in the game, but I just did for you guys. So let me know what you think down in the comments. Did I miss anything? What do you think of this theory? Let me know down in the comments. Also, as always, if you enjoy these type of videos, want to see more like it, the best way to show me is by hitting that like button. And if you're new to the channel, I do these story videos all the time. So make sure you're subscribed and have notifications on as it's the best way to stay up to date on my videos. And if you can take away anything from this video, a moral, a lesson, there's one thing I'd like to leave you off with. In this game, you watch Taylor's life flash before his eyes, and it's supremely interesting. Probably one of the most interesting life stories out of anyone you'd see. But make sure that your life is like that. One of my favorite quotes in the world is, one day your life is going to flash before your eyes. Make sure you have something interesting to watch. Kind of like Taylor did. In the frozen forest. I said, what's your name? 